Hello everyone, I'm Klaus Aranha at the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Designs for Computer Science. In this video I want to talk about experiments, which you usually see as something central to science. So uh, let's go. In the last video I introduced you to a dynamic framework to understand science. If you remember, in the center of that framework we had the area for experimentation which is how we collect data to better understand our scientific ideas. So in this video, I'm going to talk about a bit what is an experiment and how do we, should we think about it and what are the characteristics of a good experiment. I want you to think about this when you're thinking about the experiments of your own research. This idea of discussing what is science, what is an experiment, what is knowledge, is the domain of philosophy of science. So we are doing philosophy now. Sorry, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Anyway, in the philosophy of science, we are interested in discussing how we can know things about the world. Can we learn things by only using logic or is something else necessary? One of the lines of thought in the philosophy of science that interests us in this course are the ideas proposed by Karl Popper. So Popper proposed the idea of experimentalism which is one, of the, one idea that defines scientific knowledge as knowledge which is obtained by systematic and rigorous observation of the world. According to Popper, rigorous observation of the world requires a very specific set of steps. That is what we usually think of when we talk about the scientific method. So the idea of a rigorous experiment, according to Popper, is that we formulate our question as a scientific hypothesis, then we can execute an experiment to try and reject that hypothesis. Now that the definition of a scientific hypothesis here is very important. One of the key ideas of a scientific hypothesis is that it is falsifiable. This means that it should be possible for any scientific hypothesis to describe an experiment that its results could be used to reject that hypothesis. If this is not possible to think of a situation where you would have to reject your hypothesis, then your experiment is not scientific, well, at least according to Popper. So, for example, uh, Popper lived at a time when psychoanalysis, proposed by Freud, was really popular. And according to Popper, psychoanalysis was not a science because it was not possible to describe an experiment that could possibly prove the theories that's of psychology to be wrong. Of course, people who studied psychoanalysis disagreed with Popper, but I would say that the description of Popper of a scientific experiment is very useful for us to describe what is a rigorous research. The idea of a falsifiable hypothesis is a very good one because it limits us to what we can use as initial ideas and it guides us to what sort of experiments are useful. If a scientific hypothesis is falsifiable, this means that our goal should be to try and falsify the hypothesis, to show that it is a strong hypothesis or to learn something new. In fact, this is a very important part of the Popperian line of thought, the idea that you learn more by being wrong than by being right. Falsifying a hypothesis gives us more information about the world than just confirming what we already knew to be true. Anyway, I want to extend the idea of a falsifiable hypothesis to the idea of a fair experiment. Here, the idea of a fair experiment is an experiment that gives us the best chance to reach some sort of true knowledge. When I say fair, that's because the idea is that we're not trying to force one specific result, but really trying to honestly learn more about the world. So, what makes a fair experiment? The first point that I want to talk about is providing something to compare against. This is related to the idea that a scientific experiment can be falsifiable. So what does this mean? This means that a scientific experiment needs at least two possible results. Because if you know the result of your experiment before you begin, then you don't learn anything from the experiment, right? So let's think of some of examples of comparisons. For example, we can think of the comparison between two different systems, such as 
do chocolate cookies taste better or worse than mint cookies? And we can do an experiment to compare this. So we have two systems and we have we can compare one against the other. We can also think about different ways to explain a phenomenon. For example, we know that sometimes bananas go black when you put them in a refrigerator. So we can say that we have two explanations. It could be because of bacteria growing the banana, or it could be because of the temperature of the refrigerator. Because we have two explanations, we can do an experiment to check which of these explanations is correct. Another way to think of something to compare against is an experiment to test the characteristics of a system that we want to study. This is good, especially for engineering. For example, we want to feed a family using apples. So we need to know how many apples a apple tree produces in one year. So we can calculate this, if this value is enough to feed the entire family. In all these examples, it's important that we establish the different possible results of our experiment. So this is the idea. We have an experiment that has different possible results. Continuing with this line of thought, when we are defining our scientific hypothesis, we want to make it as specific as possible. If the hypothesis is very specific, it will make it easier for us to determine the result of the experiment. On the other hand, if the hypothesis is generic, or if the question that we're trying to answer in our experiment is too vague, this makes it harder to design the experiment and then harder to analyze the result. So let's look at this example. Imagine that you are a person researching a new optimization method. Now, a very bad way to create a hypothesis would be to say something like, my hypothesis is that my optimization method is the best. Why is this bad? Well, we are not comparing anything to anything else complete. We're just saying, oh, the method is best. How can we prove that? Okay, and what does the word best even means in this context? So we need to be more specific. This example is a little bit extreme, but let's look at this second example, which is something that I actually see in papers sometimes. The proposed method is better than existing methods. This is still not specific enough, enough to be useful. So for example, what are these existing methods? Is this every method in the world? Do you test your method against every single method that has ever been proposed? And, and what does it mean? What does better mean anyway? So we want to specify a little bit more. Using, po using polynomial mutation is better than Gaussian mutation for optimization methods. Now, we know which methods we are comparing against. So we are comparing polynomial and Gaussian. Great. But this is still not very falsifiable because of this tricky little word here, better. And you can notice that I really don't like the word better when we are talking about science. Better could mean anything. So it's not a very good word to use in scientific hypothesis. It could mean faster, it could mean more precise, it could be more elegant, it could be, it could be anything. So it's hard to create an experiment that falsifies better. So to arrive at the end of the example, we have this final version of the hypothesis. Polynomial mutation increases the convergence rate of an optimization method when compared to Gaussian mutation. Now, this is nice, right? This is much more specific. When we look at this sentence, it's easy to imagine what would be an experiment that the result would be either yes, this is true, or no, it's, this is false. Of course, this could be improved more by saying exactly how much we expect the convergence rate to improve. But I think you got the idea of what I'm trying to say. Be as specific as you can. To summarize this point, and remember, here we're talking about Karl's Popper philosophy of science, a good scientific hypothesis is one that is falsifiable. In other words, it's possible to imagine and execute an experiment that could reveal to us if the hypothesis is false. In computer science, it's unfortunately very common for people to discuss problems in terms that are not very falsifiable. This usually happens 
when we are talking about systems that could always be improved, could always be hacked to give us something a little bit better. So, for example, a researcher proposes a method in computer science, and this method has many parameters and can be applied to many problems. If you're not careful, it can become very hard to, meaningful, to do meaningful experiments for this method, like this first example here. What we want to do is to always be very specific about the goals of our research. What conditions, what parameters, what problems, and what measures define success or failure in our research proposal. Of course, I understand that one of the reasons that this happens is that failure in science is very scary. We want our experiments to succeed because we think that if the experiment did not succeed, then that is a problem in us as a person, that maybe the science has no meaning. But I want to help you understand that even when the experiment does not succeed, we, st we are still learning. And this is very important. Explaining why an idea failed can be more important than doing an experiment that gives us exactly the result that we ex expected. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about a different topic. How we control the variables of a scientific experiment. When we design an experiment to answer a scientific question, we need to think about what are the variables that could change the result of the experiment. So for example, let's say that we're trying to do an experiment to determine which one tastes better, chocolate or coffee. The result of this experiment would be different if we asked small children or if we asked PhD students. So when we're doing our experiment, we have to decide and control the variable of who we are talking to. Also, there are other variables like the brand of chocolate, the brand of coffee, the temperature of the room, the temperature of the coffee, how we ask the questions, etc. All of these are parameters that have to be controlled when we do an experiment. Depending on the experiment, it can be easier or harder to control these variables. So I want to introduce three kinds of experiments depending on how much control we have over the variables of the experiment. Observational experiments, retrospective experiments, and controlled experiments. So, Observation experiments are experiments where you observe a phenomenon without interacting with it directly. For example, we can imagine an experiment in astronomy, where we observe the light of a distant star. There is not much that we can do to change this light, right? We can maybe choose which days we observe and what kind of equipment we use, but that's about it. Another experiment would be counting the number of people that are using masks in the train. We can choose to count this number in different cities, like Tokyo and Osaka, for example. So the variables that we control in an observational experiment are how we observe the data. So we need to be careful to make sure that we observe all the situations that are important for the kind of scientific question that we're trying to answer. For example, in the train mask experiment that I said, if we do not observe during the rush hour, we will miss a lot of information because usually we are interested in people using masks when there are a lot of people in the train. Or maybe we are interested in learning about what kind of people use colorful masks. And in that case, if we don't observe many and many and many and many days, we might not get enough data to make an interesting conclusion about our experiment. So these are the disadvantages of an ex uh, observational kind of experiment. Another class of experiment when we think about data gathering is the retrospective experiment. Here, instead of observing an experiment that is happening, observing an uh, event that is happening right now, we obtain data that was recorded about this event in the past. For example, we are interested in learning more about marriages. If we did an observational experiment, it would take a very long time to gather all the data. So what we could do is that we go to the city office and we get the data of all the past marriages of the last few years. So we could, for example, try to find out if there was a day in the week when marriages are more or less common. Let me share one example of retrospective example, uh, experiment that I think was really cool. So there is this temple in Japan near a lake in the mountains that freezes in winter, the lake, not the temple. 
Every year, when the lake unfreezes, the temple holds a festival. So a group of researchers took a look at the a registration of dates when the festival happened and plotted that over time. And by looking at that, they could measure the amount of climate change in that region over the years because the lake was unfreezing faster and faster and faster. And you can see that by observing that the date of the festival was changing over time. So in this way, retrospective experiments are usually cheaper since the data has already been collected and you just need to go and find it. On the other hand, you don't have as much control over the data as you have in an observational experiment. In fact, you need to be very careful about biases in data registration and missing records. For example, in the Lake Festival experiment that was mentioned, there was a big chunk of data missing during the war. And there was also one period of time when an internal dispute in the temple stopped the festivals for, for a period of time. So this is one thing to think about when you're considering this kind of experiment. Finally, we have the controlled experiments. And this is the kind of experiment that you usually think of when you're thinking uh, as a computer scientist researcher. This is the experiment where you control all the aspects of the experiment. For example, you are comparing two sorting algorithms. So you can choose the algorithms, how much data they will sort, what kind of data they will sort, what kind of computer the algorithms will run on, how many times you will, will repeat the experiment, etc. So this gives you a lot of power. But as we all know, with great power comes great responsibility. It's very easy for a researcher to introduce biases into a controlled experiment, even by mistake. For example, you can choose conditions so that it's impossible for an experiment to produce a negative result. When comparing algorithms, you can choose a data set that always favor algorithm A over algorithm B, by mistake even. So we need to be very careful about that. Another problem with controlled experiments is that they may have a heavy cost. This is not always true in computer science because computer simulations are usually cheap, but has started to change in recent years. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about introducing biases in an experiment. When you control the parameters of an experiment, and of course, this happens in controlled experiments, but it can also happen in observational experiments as well. We need to be careful not to introduce biases in the experiment. For example, if we want to compare the speed of two algorithms, but we run, we run both of them in a very powerful computer with very little data, it may be hard to see any difference. So in this case, we want to think about the execution environment to be able to see the difference between the algorithms. We also want to make sure that the environment is similar to the environment where we normally use these algorithms. So there are many possible choices that depending on the final objective of this experiment. Making these choices is one of the main tasks of experiment design. Here are some common experiment design questions. Which methods do we choose to compare? Which data sets? If we have participants, how many times we interview each? In what order do we perform our experiments? The order can be surprisingly important. Let's think of a trivial example. If we're comparing algorithms to process a large amount of data, the speed can change if the data is cached or not cached. So the order of the algorithm has an effect on the result. As you can see, there are many other choices here, and it would be impossible to list every possible so choice that you can make in an experiment. But the IT idea is for you to think carefully about what factors in your experiment can influence the results and then think about how you would design the experiment to minimize this influence. Let me give you uh, one concrete example. Let's say that we are comparing the running time of two computer programs. We know that the running time of a program is not constant. If you ever try to measure the running time of a program, you may have noticed that it changed a little bit. Some things that affect is how many programs are running your computer or the amount of memory and power that you have. Some of these factors you can control. For example, you can use the exact same computer. But there are also factors that you cannot control. For example, modern operating systems run several programs that you can control. If you are unlucky, then maybe the defragmentation program will run right when you're doing your experiment. <clears throat> 
and affect your results. So how do you prevent that? One of the main ways that we have to reduce this amount of variation is to repeat the experiment many times and take the average. It's important to understand that repeating many times and taking the average is a technique with the objective of reducing the influence of these random factors that we can control. Even then, we still need to understand what these random factors could be. Let's say a second example, just to give you a comparison. This time we use humans. Imagine that you are doing an experiment to compare the design of two websites. This is done very often in this industry and it's called A-B testing. Anyway, you have two websites, one that uses images, one that does not use images. And you want to know which design is easier for users to find information. So you prepare an experiment where the user has to find some information in site A and use find some information in site B and you want to know which one is faster. What is the problem with this design? Well, if we always do the experiment in the same order, first site A and then site B, what happens is that the human will learn because that's what humans do, they learn. So they learn a little bit about the problem after site A and the performance will be a little bit better at site B with no relations with the design of the websites. It's because the human learned. So in this experiment, we have a factor in the result that is not related to what we want to study. In this case, the role of experiment design is to remove the influence of this factor. So what we could do is, for example, to ask each user to only test one of the websites. Or maybe we can change the order from time to time. So some users test website A first, some users test website B first. Okay, final example. Let's say that we propose a neural network for a new vision problem and we can compare it with some traditional architectures. One thing that happens in neural networks is that we try many variations of hyperparameters until we get one that works really well. However, when we compare against the traditional method, we are using the traditional method straight from the literature. What is the problem here? Well, we are giving an advantage to our method because of the fine tuning and the hacking that we did when developing the method. If you think about it, this is almost like some sort of training that we are doing with our method. So if we really want to know if the model is better than the traditional model, we need to give the same advantage to the traditional model. In other words, we also need to do fine tuning and hacking on the traditional model so that both models have the same amount of human work behind them. So as you can see, uh, there are many choices that you have to make when you design an experiment. And these choices, they can have a deep impact in the results. This causes a problem. A researcher has an initial hypothesis and designs an experiment to test the hypothesis. But the experiment fails and the researcher decides to change the experiment a little bit. And the experiment fails again and the researcher creates a third design. The third design succeeds and the researcher publishes that. Hooray! Well, no, you can see that there is a problem here, right? We lose the information from the first and the second failed experiments, which could be very important. In fact, maybe the third success is not even very important compared to the original result. To prevent this problem, there is this idea of pre-registered experiments. This is very common in medicine and, and psychology, but not so common before in computer science yet. The idea is that first you publish your research protocol and then you do your experiment exactly as you published and then after that you publish the results. This helps separate design and experiment and helps maintain accountability in science. So I highly suggest that you take a look at this website to learn more. Okay, the final thing I want to talk about is reproducibility. Reproducibility means that another person is able to do the same experiment that you did and can reach the same result. This is important because, in the end, one of the goals of science is to improve the total amount of knowledge in the human race. Remember, when we talked about Marie Curie sharing the techniques with other people, this is the idea. So, if you are the only person that can do your experiment, well, then your experience is not very useful, right? Fortunately, computer science is a bit lucky in this regard because it's relatively easy to make a computer science experiment reproducible.
Some points that we have to take, take care with to make our reproducible experiment is first, we need to be very clear when we describe our experiments in papers and presentations. We write down all the details, the parameters, the design, the process, so another person reading your paper can follow the same steps. Then, even though we are very clear, we need to make the data and code of our experiments open. Even if the paper is really, really clear, there's always some implementation details that are not that, that can cause problems. So open code is essential in research. Same thing for data. Even if you explain how you obtain the data, still it can be a lot of work that can impede the reproduction of your, of your experiment. So it's good if you can share the data so that other people can look at what you did. The way I think about it is that a majority of research in the world, and definitely the majority of research in Scuba, is funded by public sources. So it is our duty to give back to the society, but by making the results of our research public. Also, not only for replication, but open data allows other scientists to build upon your work, to explore ideas that you did not have at the time, or even did not consider. So open science is also important to accelerate the rate of scientific development. So let's summarize our talk for today. The idea I want to transmit to you is that many scientific discoveries depend on the results of good experiments and good data. And to obtain high quality data from your experiments, you need to perform them carefully. This involves doing a good design, thinking about controlling the parameters, and opening your data and your and your source in the end so other people can reproduce your results. This careful consideration is what's called experiment design and it will be the theme for the rest of the course. So for, for future lectures, we're going to focus a little bit more on the statistical analysis side of experiment design, but I will provide resources in Manavo for other topics that I think that you should study and consider. Well, this final video was a little bit long, but I hope you enjoyed our first lecture and I see you for the rest of the semester. See you there.